if you ever wanted to meet somebody that uh, lives and breathes the values that the FAW have, that is him. Rambo will probably still be able to hang around for another. Yeah, I, think uh, so. I, yeah, I think he'd be able, physically he'll be able to go around again. And Joe with his, uh, you know, some people are just, you, you keep them within the group. Yeah, but I, and look, we're we're lucky. We're luck, you know people get caught up in the debate which one's yeah, the best and just enjoy it. Yeah, we're we're just lucky that we got to live and see what they done uh, and raise the whole game for everybody. And then Mum came back and she just said, "Ah, wolves on you anymore," and and that was it. And loved it. I, I absolutely loved everything about the club, the people. It was because I get an opportunity to go back and be in West Wales. I could live yeah. at home, play for Swansea. And he go and he was like saying, "Oh, that's." You know, we, we spent X amount of million on that person and I was like, not my fault, will you waste your money on it? <laughs> hey guys, I'm Sai, welcome to Ace Podcast Nation. We're back for another episode of my story here at Eat Sleep Media and uh, I'm delighted to be uh, joined by ex Cardiff City player. Mr. Kevin Evans, how are you, my friend? I'm very good, yeah. Thank you for and having me. It's uh... Travelled all the way from Australia to do the podcast as well. Well, you know, you're a celebrity now, so That's it's nice it. to come and the things we do for you, but... There we go, nah, coincided with, obviously, uh, doing the coaching courses. Don't so tell them that. Don't overdoing, tell them. overdoing came, my came license and, and, uh, and, yeah, being an opportunity to catch up with you and uh, reminisce a little bit on some of the days and, and talk about all things football and life, I guess. Indeed, mate. And it, what a what a week... To uh, to come back to Wales for as well, like, so you um you arrived on Saturday last week and Wales beat Ukraine the yeah. next day. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely buzzing. So it was uh, got really lucky. Really, all coincided with the same time that we were doing the course. The course was already booked in, and because of obviously the delay of games with Ukraine, Scotland, and and the playoff game, it just got an opportunity to, in the shocking circumstances, got an opportunity to watch the game and. Um, it was just incredible. My brother managed then to get tickets, so which was even oh, even more yeah even more surreal. And you know, and you you go there, and there was this. Uh, I I was pretty confident that we would win. I just thought that somewhere within the game that we would be able to, uh, you know, with the quality that we have in the front line, we'd be able to score. But uh, as missed some chances, though, didn't we? We did, we did. But as it turned out, Ukraine were excellent, and yeah, uh, you know, people good. say, ah. Oh, they're riding on emotion, which no doubt does fuel them a little bit, but they're also riding on the uh, uh, back of some absolutely superb footballers. And it kept taking us back to Paul Bowden in 94 uh, yeah. and the amount of times uh, it was just, that's crept back into the mind going into it. But I think this this player group is quite funny. My, like our generation, we... We're, we, we're scarred yeah, by it, haven't we? But these guys aren't. Yeah. They're almost... They yeah. used to qualify. Yeah, like, my, my son turns around and goes... What's the big deal? Because he's 16, he's seen us in two Euros and now going to a World Cup and, and yeah, you kind of go, crazy. but I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I think it's, you know, you know for, for where we've come as a football nation, I think that's just incredible. Yeah, it's mad. I'm doing, um, I'm doing a, a podcast actually soon with Lawrence, who's um, just come in now, um, who's, uh, he works for Talk Sport as their Wales football correspondent. And we're doing a, a podcast on the transformation of Welsh football yeah. from, it was going to be called From Speed to the World Cup. But I think actually it's going to be called from Tosh after the World yeah, Cup. Yeah, I'm glad you put in Tosh. Because yeah. he was the one who gave all these youngsters. Yeah. He abandoned results to blood yeah. the generation in 10 years' time. And that's what we have, uh, you know, we're reaping the benefits of that now. Yeah. And actually, they've just made a documentary on uh, Yeah, Tom I've Tosh seen it. I can't wait to watch it. I was, uh, uh, I've seen a preview and it's very, very good. I was listening to uh, Ellis James and Bubs and everybody yeah, on, yeah. The, on the distant pod and... Uh, and they were talking about it, and yeah, you know, we forget again in terms of the achievement he made and as a 100%. as a coach. And but you know, it's I found myself quite emotional about the whole, you know, co- you know, self- qualifying in itself is probably. But so, I'll tell you a story about that. Huh? Yeah, there was a huge, uh, you know, and uh, almost like another grieving process that kicked in around the whole Gary Speed side of it, and yes. uh, uh, and even on the course, you know, they um, they. They spoke about it from coach education okay. who were, who was there at the start of the journey and the cultural change and the the values in particular of how we conduct ourselves within a, uh, a footballing organisation and uh, and they how they live and breathe in values. You know, we all mm-hmm. have values about how we want to conduct ourselves, but living them out is something completely different. And um, but they do it superbly. And uh, you know, you you look at them. It's even though all the ones who've qualified, they find themselves thanking other people. 
Yeah. And, you know, Rob Page was saying, oh yeah, I'm thankful of Speed, I'm thankful of Coleman. And, you know, there's a there's a real humbleness about how how we're going about ourselves as a nation at the moment. I think for, without sounding sort of like a bit of a cliche, is that together stronger thing is kind yeah. of not just a hashtag. It, you can see that it radiates from the FAW now all the way down through the squads to the fans yeah. to everyone the red wall and stuff like that um so with the game that was the one it was the most stressful game of football i've ever watched and i've watched some yeah. stressful winners. Yeah. Yeah. however as i was explaining to my 17 year old uh, yesterday pre-2016 um I had accepted that I was never going to see Wales at a, a major tournament. Yeah. I had come to terms with it. It wasn't like a, a a thing. Like I'd come to terms with it. And then when we qualified for 2016 in the Euros, I was emotional, excited, all that. It was an amazing experience, unbelievable. But I didn't cry. I didn't. I was just happy. Yeah. And then when that when the final whistle went and I don't know whether it's a build up of stress missed chances saves from Hennessy mm. and things oh, last minute saves. blocks from oh Williams God. and yeah. Davis and stuff yeah it was phenomenal final whistle went and I just broke down in tears and I, mm. it was such a surreal experience for me because I'd never cried really over football mm. um, come close but never really like I just broke down in tears um, and I spent a long, a long time sort of thinking about Gary Speed and then I text my father-in-law and said, uh, "Fancy a trip to Qatar or something?" <laughs> just you know, just something I messed about. And then, um, and then it turned out he had kind of done the same. So we had like cried mm. together, but separately and via like, text. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah. Just, it was just this weird yeah. thing. It and, was. Yeah. But I think he was very much in the same situation as as me and probably mm. you and people of our generation. We'd kind of accepted it that yeah. we weren't going to qualify. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, that generation came through, and then you've obviously got another generation coming through now. But I never remember Wales having the depth that they've got now. Yeah, yeah. Like the players on the bench against Ukraine, like he took Gareth Bale off for ten minutes to go, which I thought was a risk. Yeah, but yeah. it shows the confidence he's got. Yeah, I think he was, he was done. Yeah, it was a case of you know you got to be respectful of of where Gareth at physically. He's yeah. yeah. It was just if they if he went to penalties an extra time, it yeah. was like. He wouldn't have got there. No, he, he did there. look out yeah. on his feet. So, I think um, like Brennan Johnson, come on, and he he's really pushing for a space in the in the team. Um, I said before the game, I actually thought he should have started, and I would have probably put Daniel James on the bench. Not because Daniel James had done anything wrong, mm. but I felt like if you bring him on at like the hour seventy minute mark, he's so quick. Mm. Like yeah, every game we play now, he's he's. Like we, yeah. he always gets like at least a one on one or yeah. a breakthrough, and I thought a tired Ukraine side, especially after they did that Scotland game. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a yeah. Weapon. Look, and it's that's the beauty of it, isn't it? We, you can talk with so many people about. Oh, I think I just started Harry Wilson. Yeah. or I just started this, and it's brilliant that we can have them conversations anyway. In terms Couldn't of the depth, have those conversations previously. Yeah, in terms of uh, you know starting Daniel James, it's more of a case of. With, you know, with Gareth Bale, the, uh, the defensive side of the work now isn't really something. He still gets himself in good areas and cuts off lanes and everything, but it's more of if they had him, Rambo and Johnson on at the same time from the start, yeah. it would have been a long, long slog for 70 minutes and not been at least Daniel James gives us that outlet and get him behind. And, uh, but it's it's just incredible. You know, we, and we, we look at Ukraine, we forget, you know, there are almost 40 million people in Ukraine. and. Yeah. Uh, big, big when difference, you, when you look it? at us as in like three million, and when I talk to the people back in Australia about uh, you know the significance of us qualifying for the World Cup, so I live in Queensland. Queensland has more people than Wales, uh, and then I say, you know, imagine Queensland qualifying for a, mm -hmm. a football World Cup, and they go, well, oh. Birmingham is bigger than Wales, isn't yeah. It? It's like yeah, 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 incredible the difference. Yeah, but it, it's it's fantastic. But it, it's more of a case of you know you look at the uh, it's not just that's the it's the positive results that we're having in the 21s and the under 18s and the uh, under 17s and we've been fortunate this week spend a bit of time with uh, Richie Williams who's the uh, 17s coach still very close to Matty Jones who's the 18s coach mm. and gone in as Paul Bowden's assistant this week and he's also assistant in this in the women's squad and 
uh, and culturally, I, I've known Matty since I was 12, 13 years of age. We, we literally grew up together. If you ever wanted to meet somebody that uh, lives and breathes the values that the FAW have, that is him. He is, you know, all class and everything, and has been from like 13 years of age. Yeah. It's incredible how it's just been, just, that's been him. So the people you get, the person you get to see in the media is, is the person that he is, really. Yeah, he's, um, there's, I've got like a list at home of people within the Welsh system who I would like to get on a podcast that at some point he's on there. Oshan yeah. Roberts is on there. Yeah, people have got just loads so, love to speak yeah, to. Yeah, uh, and Oshan's the one there. Doesn't get enough credit, I don't well, think, Oshan Roberts. Internally, so within the Welsh system, mm. uh, they rave about him. I still rave about mm. him because uh, I was lucky in, um, as a child coming going through the... 15s, 16s, 18s, school boys, uh, school team, no, Welsh team, sorry. Uh, Oshan would often come in just as a, uh, as almost like an invitational go a coach, just to coach one session here and there. Uh, superb. The level of detail, uh, the delivery method, the relationship he built within a, the group within, a, within one session was amazing, but really articulate. So it's no surprise to me that he's doing well at Palace. It, and I think they'd kick on again. Uh, I think he's got he's got the ability to to be able to go and mix it at a without being rude to Palace, but a, a bigger club again yeah. than the Premier League. So, but it, it's it's in a good space, you know. Dave Adams is a great guy again, loads of knowledge. It really understands teaching. Cal Darlington, you can just look at yeah, your chest a few, yeah, yeah, and keep pumping them out. So, the you know the the people that we have around that Welsh team at the moment to keep supporting Rob Page and all the coaching group there, we we got. We were fortunate to see uh, Damon Rodens. Like you know, Damon Rodens is phenomenal, and um, yeah, and just the people that they've got there to lean on for some experiences. Uh, you know, we, we class ourselves in having a world-class coach education system, uh, and that's what we've had. We we have achieved that. We are as good as a coach education in anywhere in the world. Which is, you know, you think of that from Wales and football is again our generation. It'd have been if you'd have said it in rugby. You'd have gone, yeah. oh yeah, we'll have a development pool, no problem. We'll have these coaches, and uh, but we we actually are living and breathing that, which is something I didn't think we'd ever see in our, my mm. lifetime. No, even the facilities and everything, you know, back in the day probably weren't um, weren't in line with other nations, mm. but now everything, everything from the facilities, the coaching, the co- you know, the backroom staff, uh, the analysis, the, yeah. everything is is right up there. I think um, it's fascinating because. After this World Cup, there's a few players who probably will retire, you know, like Joe Allen and and Bale, maybe Ramsey. And then you look at the the players sort of behind them, and you've already got. I know you're. I'm not saying that they're ready-made replacements because they're all quality players mm. who've done it at the highest level. But like Ampadu, is, in my opinion, is much going to be a really uh, fantastic holding midfielder for us. Mm. He's got the aggression. He's got all the things which a young Joe Allen had, mm. but he's also technically very gifted. Yeah, yeah. tidy, isn't he? Just needs to perhaps uh, just make sure his aggression is controlled sometimes, mm. I think. Although I think he was unlucky when he got sent off in the Euros. Yeah, you need it. Yeah, look, it's, it's part of, you know, you don't want to change anybody's characteristics no. or anything, but it's it, it's it's exciting. It's, you know, we're, we're obviously unbelievably happy that this generation of players who have been. Uh, incredible for us and putting us on the world stage, get an opportunity to do it in the World Cup, and it's a brilliant reward for them and their careers. And but they're also mindful of part of their role now is transitioning the the replacements. And yeah. Rambo will probably still be able to hang around for another. Yeah, I think, uh, so. yeah, I think he'd be physically he'd be able to go around again. And Joe with his, you know, some people are just, you, you keep them within the group uh, mm. for what they bring. So they might be instead of. 90 minute players as you can see now with Rambo and uh, Bale they're 70 minute players and then they might just become the last 30 minute players so we can still manipulate it as long as they're keen use their experience yeah, and yeah. their knowledge around the squad yeah. um, before we move on to you specifically I've uh, got a question which I want you to answer with one word uh, Gareth Bale played for Cardiff next year will he play for Cardiff next year? Yeah. No. No? no where do you think he goes? Uh, I think he needs to go somewhere <clears throat> without being rude or without knowing what the um, the, the science behind and the and the high performance team around Cardiff. He needs to go somewhere where there's world class um, 
conditioning yeah, yeah, stuff. yeah conditioning coaches and uh, where he can where understand where his body at and, and people forget the how explosive Gareth was for like 10 years yeah. at some stage your body is going to suffer from that so it's not to say that he can't train or can't or couldn't come to Cardiff but it's uh, it's important you know he, he still has to play and he yeah, still has and to he, train and, and he needs to be ready for uh, the World Cup but then when Bellamy came they he bought his own coaches didn't he, he bought yeah. his own fitness coach yeah. and, and trains alone a couple of days a week yeah, there's potential there is. You know, it's yeah you never seen yeah it's a good point mate because he could he could come down and bring people yeah for all we know he could bring Damon Roden in or something like that and mm. just look after him and uh, which, which which you know it, it evolves doesn't it and you, yeah. you cater for whoever you can but oh, look if he could play for Cardiff it'd be I think it'd be something that he'd actually enjoy doing um, but from my perspective and Wales perspective uh, and even like being Rob Page I know he's said Probably, I don't care where he plays, yeah. and it's up to him. He does care that he, 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 does. Goes he, wants, to, yeah. he wants the right move. He does, for him. yeah. Last thing we want is getting, you know, we're all still caught up in the bubble of it, and the last thing we want is when we're coming to the World Cup is that Bale, you know, people are saying, oh, Bale isn't very good, he can't even do it in the Championship, he yeah. can't do this, he's, you know, physically that's that and the other, where he'd be he better off. He to play as well, if he, he goes somewhere yeah. and he doesn't play. Well, and I, th I think he'd play, you know, we've seen the Spurs, when he went to Spurs, I thought he'd done well there, and be, yeah, well. people saying that he can't do it, I, I thought he'd done really well A lot of people in our live chat last yesterday in the football show said that they thought he should go to the MLS, because it's uh, one, one game a week, the standard's not quite yeah. as good, it's not yeah. as physical. My thing with that is, outside of Robbie Keane, maybe a few players over the recent times have gone over there, British players who've gone over there when they've still wanted to play international football, and when they've been out there for six months to a year and they come back, they're not quite as mm. sharp and as good. Mm. And I think the whole point is that he wants to be sharp for the World Cup. Mm. He wants to be sort of at his, at, you know, the best of his abilities. Um, but there's, you know, there's a few Premier League clubs which I'm sure would have a look at him. Yeah. Newcastle, United. Yeah. Um, I think Man United. You know, they've just lost three wingers or four wingers or whatever, attacking players. Yeah. He wouldn't be the worst signing because they've got quite yeah. a young squad. Look, it's incredible. Though we've gone from saying uh, going to Cardiff, and now we've mm. ended up with him being yeah. at Man United, and it's it ultimately it, it's ultimately completely up to him, isn't it? And don't what know he wants him. to do. Yeah, but it's you know. He, he needs to train. He needs to train because we know that when he's on the field, what he brings to the group and uh, you know his abilities. The amount of times he got the ball in the first half against Ukraine as that outlet and secured that first ball and switched to play. His first touch is yeah, unreal. Mid, yeah, his first yeah. touch is. Uh, uh, oh look, he was a world class player. And back in 2012, we're talking he was top three, top three in the world. And yeah. um, I think he's the closest player who's ever come in. While Ronaldo and Messi have still been playing, I think he's the one who got closest to him. I think Neymar never really got close to being yeah. like in that. That's top when they two. were at their best as well. Yeah. Talking, you know, they were phenomenal. And yeah, it's a really good point because he was the only one that physically looked like, uh, and the amount of goals he scored and the manner of goals he was scoring that probably potentially could have got up to that, but. God, we're talking about two absolute freaks there. Yeah, they changed the game, haven't they? Compared yeah, to yeah. years ago. Yeah, like well, that's I, like every sport, isn't it? It's anybody who changes. It the, evolves. Yeah, it? like John Loma and rugby. We still go back to the way that he changed changed rugby and yeah. wingers. And you talk about Maradona's. You can go into loads of sports and boxing and, and anything. Nadal and people yeah. like that. Yeah, but uh, the thing with um, Messi and Ronaldo, which is very quickly for me, is like back in the day, uh, your Shearers and your Michael Owens. They're, they're, if they scored 30 goals in a season in all competitions, that was a outstanding mm. season. If Messi or Ronaldo scored 30 goals in all competitions, it's disappointing. Yeah, it's unbelievable, it's it? unreal yeah. that that's become yeah. the standard for not just them, but yeah. for they saw well, say well, they, they who's like, the best. Is. They were like 40 goals plus a year for 15, 20 years running. It's just unbelievable Ludicrous return on goals. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I look, we're we're lucky. We're lucky. You know, people get caught up in the debate, which one's yeah, the best, and just enjoy it. Yeah, we're we're just lucky that we got to live and see what they've done, uh, and raise the whole game for everybody. Really, I think Ronaldo will be the first player to play in the Champions League, first outfield player to play in the Champions League, age forty. That's my prediction. Yeah. Well, you look at him, he's immaculate, isn't he's he? Just, he's a bit like us too, really. Yeah, he's like way. looking in the mirror. Yeah, it, it is exactly that. Yes, yeah, so I was, I thought that this morning. And uh, yeah, he's what is he? Thirty-seven now. Yeah. You could easily see him going yeah. on for another three yeah. years. Again, you know, these guys, obviously... It's the motivation, though, isn't it? Yeah, the focus the, to the keep yourself in that shape. 
you know, they, we're talking about multi, multi millionaires yeah. here, and so their their love of the game and love of what they do yeah. is is quite astonishing. Even like the coach, the players who we're now starting to see coming into coach at Premiership level, like Gerrards and Lampards, and uh, you know, these guys don't need it, right? No, they're set up for not just their lives; they've set up for their great grandchildren's mm -hmm. lives as well. But they're just their that love of the game and continuing to you know it's probably a good story from a, a moral perspective and a human perspective to keep trying to improve yourself and be better and explore different things within within Ambition, the space to be the you're best, in. Though, yeah. to be the best you can be yeah, and, yeah it's, you know, um, big egos driving it no doubt course, as well yeah. but it's often often they need that ego everyone's got an ego though and they mm. i think anyone who pretends they haven't yeah to a certain degree but i mean obviously it's different levels i suppose yeah the um right let's move on to you a little bit um so what I like to do with these, oh, break the chair, um, is I like to sort of take you right back to the start and then kind of progress and mm -hmm. share a few stories as we go along. But tell us a bit about um, you as a as a youngster and like you growing up. And yeah, well, from like, yeah, um, like everybody really loved loved my childhood. I was in West Wales and. Um, predominantly around the area of like Kilgarran, like village by Newcastle, Slemling, Cardigan and Crimmick, just locked in the pocket in between all them three. Uh, and the people there really shaped uh, who I was and uh, what I'd done as a, as a or, or, and continue to do as a person really. But it's, uh, so I didn't start playing football till I was about 11. It's um, quite late. Yeah, it? well, now it's late, but back then there wasn't really much, especially in West Wales, and, it, and it's really, we'll probably speak about it a little bit, it's, Still, you know, heartbreaking when you go back and see uh, the facilities that are still over there, and um, they sometimes feel like, well, the lack of support there, and mm. you know, because it's still forty-five minutes to Kamal in from where we live, you know. So when we talk about going to development centres in Swansea, well, that's an hour and a half drive from from yeah, where we were. Track, and, yeah, it was unachievable. But what? So what? Where I was lucky was big sporting family. My father's family, or oh, my father was a rugby player and boxer and, uh, and okay. enjoyed that part of it. And parents broke up when, when I was 10. And uh, But my mum's side of the family were, was all football. So kind of got that rounded approach to sport and athlete development uh, without really knowing it really. Mm. In a village, big council estate, uh, loads of you know, teenagers, the same age as myself, but older than myself. So, you know, you kind of got that. We had to develop this game called Hakaruti where it was just basically you were allowed to two foot somebody mm -hmm. as long as it wasn't from behind. So if they're coming ahead, yeah. But it was, go. Yeah, so what it taught you to do was move the ball quickly yeah. and directly and... Uh, uh, on your feet. Yeah, yeah. So, they, you know, it's, it, was, and it was a good laugh. It was good fun, but mm -hmm. it, and all sports. and uh, But then, yeah, so I played my first game for my brother's team uh, when he was like under 12s or something like that. And, it, and within two years, I was living in Leeds. Mm -hmm. uh, so the... the from not That's playing a quick the, around, yeah, 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 and it was uh, I had a jog teacher Mike Davis who played Welsh Prem and was an excellent footballer, and he rang up the the David Schools coach and said, "Oh look, we've got a player that I think you should have a look at," and mm. invited me in for a game. And then uh, when I played that game, one of the coaches from Lampeter had a contact in Wolves, and he just rang me up and he was like, "Hey, you're going to Wolves on Sunday? I'll pick you up at this time." and so I was like, okay. So I drove up to Wolves, stayed there for, uh, was in and out training with their schoolboys and playing for their teams till for about six months. They rang me up then one day and said, uh, oh, have you enjoyed your time with us? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've loved it. And he goes, oh, is your mum there? And I was like, no, she's coming back at this time. I thought I was buzzing. I was like, oh, no, they're going to sign me. And, uh, and then mum came back and she just said, ah, Wolves don't want you anymore. And, and that was it. Uh, and you're Did like, they give you like a reason or nothing? Or just or maybe they gave mum a reason, but uh, yeah, she, you know, in terms of as we do sometimes, just yeah, yeah now it is what it is, get on with it, sort of thing. And yeah, but heartbroken, literally mm. thinking, oh my god, from going around thinking that uh, this was it, yeah, this was it. And um, I, the irony of it all, none of the Welsh teams had, I'd never even had anything from Swansea, Cardiff, uh, mm. Wrexham, or anything like that, but then so playing for David. Uh, Liverpool played a game again, uh, up in North Wales and Liverpool came and watched it and so went in and played a game for them against um, Lily Shaw as it was as they used to be then and it was you know done really well. School of excellence. Yeah, yeah, done well. Steve Highway uh, wanted to sign me then and but I'd already I said I was going up to Leeds just to 
because Glenn Leatherham was the coach and he was also the David School's uh, assistant coach. So, so there was like a link there. Yeah, already. there was a link. And Matty Jones was going up there already. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, so it just started off then. I went up to Leeds. Uh, we played against Borough. Really enjoyed it. Uh, had a week up there. Uh, and it was... Uh, uh, yeah, I then went back up for a week with Kane. So they said after that game that they wanted wanted to sign me as well. So it was a little bit of to and fro in between Liverpool and Leeds. And chose Liverpool, uh, Leeds in the end, sorry, chose Leeds purely because um, uh, it, you know, they had, at that time as well, they were a top four Premier League club anyway. So they were in Liverpool. And, uh, and it was a couple of years before that, they'd only just won the old Division One. And uh, Gary Speed, of course, was up there as well, yeah. who was uh, somebody I loved, even though I love Rush and everyone as well. Uh, but yeah, just chose Leeds. So and then the FA brought a rule out that you couldn't sign players more than ninety minutes away from where you lived. So what Leeds done? They just moved everybody. They moved our whole team. So the Irish boys, myself and Matty, moved us up. Uh, moved so us up to Leeds. When you say they moved, you did move you like move your family up there. No, or just, they just, just put me. you in like digs. Yeah, digs. So there was uh, I was in digs in a beautiful area, lovely family I was staying with, and finishing school up there. So you'd go to school in the morning, come out and train with the youth team from 10 till 12, uh, have some food, back into school till 4, 4.30, uh, and then back on the bus, back over to train and train with your own age group, and then go home. So I'd done that every day for about six months, and then where I got, I got really homesick. So I got homesick when the season finished. When the season was going on, no problem, because it's so active, and uh, but got really homesick, so managed to talk to Leeds about... Uh, Going back and finishing my school in Priscelli and uh, I must How rugby. Old you I must play rugby. So Did it was, you? yeah, I really must because my school was more of a rugby school yeah. and uh, uh, yeah, I really miss playing rugby. I used to love playing rugby and again that that dual sports part of me that I'd had all the way through. So even though I wasn't playing many games, I was still playing rugby, football, cricket, you know, yeah. anything that was going. And uh, but I yeah, I really miss just uh, almost a release really from from football and um, yeah so I went back finished my year or whatever it's called now I've done my GCSEs in mm -hmm. Wales basically and so you'd only been like 15 14 15 when you moved up to Leeds yeah yeah 14 I just See, turned that's, 14 it's a big yeah. uh, it's a big thing isn't it to move that young away from yeah. your family yeah. and then also I was interested like you said you had to tell him you were homesick and stuff when the season finished but that's also difficult for a 14 15 yeah. year old to do yeah. to go to their you know boss or manager or whatever and say and, yeah. you know I'm particularly back then yeah well they, they knew me by then as well and I was always headstrong mm. so uh, I remember going into school in, uh, in Boston Spa Comp in Leeds and walked into the nurse's room and she could see I was just about to like, start yeah, bawling and uh, and she just went right everybody out and I said yeah, I, I need to go home I'm like really struggling with homesickness and and she said okay ring up Paul so because the, they all had the every coach's contacts and everything in school that's how close the relationship was and mm. so I had to ring up our youth academy director and say uh, I'm going home I'm homesick and, and he was like oh but you know you got a contract and this that and the other I said I don't care I don't care mm. I'm going home and rang up my mum said yeah I'm coming home come and get me and she said, oh, but what? I said, come get me. Boof, she put the phone down and she was up there within four hours. And my dad, and it's funny, I still talk to my dad about it. And he's like going, he goes, I would never come to get you. He goes, I'd have let you there, left, made you stay there and just made you suck it up. And But I'd have come home, I'd have walked home, I wouldn't have cared. Yeah. And, you know, so then what we had to do was every Sunday, I would have to go and play for Leeds. And so Saturday morning, uh, if I could, if it was a, close enough game or if I could get later flights so what they always want is for the home Leeds games on a Saturday we had to be ball boys mm. so uh, what I would do then I'd jump on a train at half five in Carmarthen in the morning and then I'd spit out up at Leeds at about quarter past one in the afternoon taxi into the stadium you know for a 14, 15 year old boy I look yeah, back now and go my son's 16 there's absolutely no I way I yeah. yeah and uh, and you think about it you know, wearing Leeds tracksuits going through Manchester and uh on a Saturday yeah. as well, where it's uh, peak football time, and mm -hmm. uh, but it's yeah. Uh, but then I got my still got my rugby kit because I could play rugby in school. Uh, and if well, if sorry, if Leeds weren't Wouldn't playing, allowed to do that these days. No chance, yeah. yeah. They probably still. I hope they still do it, but don't they tell don't, them. Um, yeah. yeah, they don't let them. Yeah. Yeah. We weren't, I wasn't supposed to, I know no. I wasn't supposed to. But so I moved back up to Leeds, and anyway, when uh, once I finished my GCSEs, 
uh, and I was ready. I was ready to go away then, and because um, you get the other part of it, don't you? When you start living away and forming your own freedom, person, isn't it? yeah. And then you're back at home again, and um, yeah, you suddenly got someone telling you what to yeah, do and tidy yeah, up after yourself. And... Yeah, but it was, yeah, it, it, I, I, I loved it. It was. They clearly rated you though the fact that they were, like some clubs, would have just said, or when you said I'm homesick and I'm going, they would have gone, yeah. right, okay, that's yeah. it. And so they clearly fancied you yeah, as a player I'd, because they were willing to accommodate you travelling. Yeah, I'd hope that they would create that environment and every club would create yeah, that environment for the, for that's the, the person. Ideal, yeah, yeah, that's but. the ideal part of it. And you're right, uh, you know, we, we were lucky. Howard Wilkinson set up the academy uh, and he set it up not just, you know, an academy as a buzzword. He, he set it up for the purpose of it for developing young people. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, we still use, when I, when I do coach education courses, you know, we, we put up on the board, you know, uh, what is youth development and, and everyone says the right thing. Oh, yeah, it's about making them better footballers and creating an environment. But so, no, no, you're developing a youth and that's it. So when you start looking at and saying, well, every person you have in the programme, you develop that person, then all of a sudden you're, what, how you measure success is a little bit different. And But, yeah, moved back up there then when I finished my GCSEs um, and loved it. I, I absolutely loved everything about the club the people fully embraced it but then loved it. yeah a bit older as well yeah yeah that the way yeah and i knew that's what i wanted then i knew like school's finished now i'm, I'm not missing out on anything and um and I, yeah I, I absolutely loved it and um I had four years in the end so i ended up turning okay. professional so i'd uh i'm when i was 17 i turned professional on my 17th birthday and i had a three and a half year professional contract and Money wasn't great, but you didn't care. You're a professional footballer, no. and you we were living in the hostel. Everything it was, was paid for. Yeah, and um, but it was funny when uh, when I first went up there after I'd agreed to sign schoolboy forms, and uh, at, the st at the stage I always remember about about Gary Speed, and uh, I, I turned up with a skinhead, but with a fringe. Mm -hmm. So it was like a frolic, and it was so long my fringe I could tuck it behind my ears. Wow. And uh, so there we were having breakfast and everything. That's a haircut. Oh man, man imagine turning up at Leeds United with with that kind of haircut. But yeah. we didn't think anything different, and I you know wasn't bothered about it. And uh, uh, actually, I loved it. I loved the mm -hmm. haircut, and I had a chip tooth and everything at the time as well. So uh, and uh, Gary Speed walked past the window, and I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, Gary Speed! <laughs> and he looked in, and he just he went past, and he came back. Looked in again because he couldn't like work yeah. out what it was. Opened the door and he goes, "You're fucking Welsh, aren't you?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah." And he was like, "Get that off your head now." And uh, so I was like, "Oh my god!" You know, I, first time he'd really spoken to me, you know, and he's like saying, "Get change yeah, yeah, your haircut." Right. But um, so then that night when I went back to the digs, Ian Hart and one of the other youth team players pinned me down, kept the fringe off, and went back in the next day yeah, and, and yeah but he was met like Gary Speed even then you know came up to me and he was like saying look where, you know where about some you from and I was like oh West Wales and he goes yeah look there's always an image and a persona about us and you've got to conduct ourselves better mm. and you know we've got to make sure that when you know how people see us Welsh people isn't like that mm. uh, you know so that that care factor that he had to just how he was perceived and how we should be perceived is um, but also looking out for you as a person, like as a kid as well. Incredible with myself, and Matty Jones. He was he was wonderful with Matty Jones, and uh, uh, but that's that's how the culture was at Leeds. You know, the Irish boys when Gary Kelly and Ian Hart when they'd go away um, with the Irish squad, they'd come back with literally five bags of Irish gear, mm. and because there was about fifteen Irish boys in our youth team. Just put it down. And say, "Hey, go boys! Yeah, go help yourselves." Because they knew we we're, we're, you know, we were council estate kids predominantly, mm -hmm. and a lot of us from broken homes, and um, and the Scottish internationals would do the same. And we we didn't have many English internationals at the time. We had Nigel Martin, I guess, and and then later on, like Lee Bowie, Woodgate, to to a to some extent. And uh, but it was, it was a hell of a youth team. You know, I look mm. back now and I go, "Well, I think it was seven full internationals came from." From my youth team, it's a big chunk, and yeah, not and many youth yeah. teams go on to produce that many international yeah. footballers. But One, it was it was good how they done it in terms of they, you know, they invested quite like I said we all turned professional at seventeen, uh, big contracts, and for for the age we were, and uh, it's no different now to what Chelsea do now. To no. but it, we were just doing it twenty years ago, mm. and uh, so yeah, you look at that youth team where you had you know, Robinson, Woodgate, McPhail. 
Matty Jones, Alan Smith, you know, just them five alone gives you gives you a decent chance to uh, yeah. to win most games. And uh, yeah, then went on went on loan at Swansea. So on uh, after I finished, I was eighteen, and uh, Glenn was now at Swansea. So Glenn was my, my scout and. Uh, and he rang me up, and I was playing resis at that stage. So once you, they feel that you're past youth team, you, you know they brought in an under 19s league. There was a resis league at the time. That was it. Then you were the resis and with the reserves league. That that was our, like the Pontins league. Yeah, whatever, yeah, so, yeah. So me and Andy had a. We used to talk about it quite a lot, and he used to say like, the 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 difference and the benefits of playing like Pontins reserve league football was competitive, and it was as mm. close to first team football as you could get. Whereas now you've got the under twenty threes and it's yeah. it's just not the same intensity. So sometimes these young players, when they do get in the first team, it takes them a while to mm. to be able to settle. Whereas back then, if you were in the reserve, if you were playing reserve team football each week and then you got moved to the first team, you were more equipped to yeah. make that jump. Would you agree with that? Because uh, obviously you're coaching now. Yeah, as well, so I'm kind of interested in. What so the under twenty threes is based up of. Uh, decades of research done on it takes often takes five years for a person to transition not a player a person to transition from a youth to an adult so the under 23s gives you that 18s to 23 so it's set up in that five year window because when you look at it when you're 18 what usually happens where you finish school you often have a license you have your car you have independence you move out from home uh, so the the routines that you've usually ha- you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and the routines that you usually have as a teenager is now completely removed and you're really forming trying to find out who you are as your own person uh, my argument to that while the Pontins League was like it was excellent and remember playing Villa and, uh, and games and they had Paul Mersons and Thompsons and Gareth Barrys and Vissette, you know they were yeah, top, real real, yeah, real, top real, players. real players in there and everything but um, on the same token they didn't enjoy playing in it. So yeah. while we were tr- coming through and going, oh my God, this is amazing, we're getting to play against these guys, they were like, whatever. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to tackle. I'm not. So you kind of go, well, uh, and the intensity side of it is, the intensity could be an argument, say, well, there's a, a lack of technical ability mm. with or thought within the game. It was, the game was different then. Don't forget, we were only four or five years out of the back pass rule being taken away. So we were still transitioning from goalkeepers just getting it and launching it to defenders yeah. one so I was a footballing defender and wanted to get the ball but if you were going into that Pontins league with a goalkeeper that was never going to play out from the back because his whole career had been formed of yeah, making sure yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's where you know Robinson's footballing ability was was superb and uh, I, I think there's a real obligation to if people like 24s aren't playing in the first team well, cramping up a spot of a youth team player in the under 23s, that's, that's not the purpose of it anyway. So people say, oh, if you're not good enough to be in the first team at 18, then you shouldn't be in there. And then you go, well, why are these senior players coming in there if they're not good enough? Yeah. I know they have to play, and I, and I totally get that. But I'd, I'd probably be swaying more towards, I just look at how football keeps progressing mm. and how the amount of actions that they do now uh, as young people coming through in comparison to... And the expectation to play a style now, what we we did have, but not to the detail that it is now. Uh, I think football's moving forward as, as a as a better at a better rate than what it has for a long time. And yeah, and I think the other thing which football is slowly maybe getting to now is or they're certainly getting there is every person um, learns, develops, trains, but also develops emotionally and grows up. Mm differently so one person might be ready at 18 they might be good enough but they also might be mentally ready to play first team football but you might also have someone who's good enough but is not mentally ready Mm. or not mature enough or has got whatever it may be a reason why they're not quite ready playing in the 23s is going to help that development before it whereas if you just chuck them in the first team because they're good enough but they're not ready can do damage which means that they don't then progress yeah, that's a really good point it's it, it, it's to give you time isn't it it's to let that person develop your developing potential i guess and uh but so i went on loan at uh, swansea mm-hmm. when uh glenn rang me up when he goes look our center back's just been sent off 
Uh, we need, and there's more for cover as a cover, so they already have two good centre backs in there anyway. Uh, so I went down there, Matty Bound, I think, got got sent off, and he had like a five, six game suspension, so it was a two month loan. And, uh, and I was looking forward to it again, but it was because I get an opportunity to go back and be in West Wales, I could live at yeah. home, play for Swansea, and uh, and I was like, oh, no, you know, there's all a lot of benefits to it. and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it was okay. It, it was a real learning experience. So on about that transition into senior football. So you know, I'd played a lot of Pontins games by this stage, and it was nothing like okay. Div Two football. So or, or as it was, it was Div Three at that mm. stage, and and it was it was nothing like that. And uh, the physicality of it, the training, and uh, but it, it, look, it served its purpose. It was a loan. It served its purpose for both people. It gave me the experience of senior football. Uh, and provided cover for them and played only played a handful of games and and then John Holland said oh we'd like to uh, you've I, I had two and a half years left at Leeds at this stage and they were like saying we'd like you to come but we can't afford to pay um, and I was like and I just said oh, look, respectfully I said oh, I've got two years left there's you know a lot can change in two years even though I knew I wasn't really going to play for Leeds because of the quality and, I, and and that's the difficult part of being a youth team player sometimes when you look above you and you know you, you, you've got to be realistic with yourself in terms of what you think you can achieve it's that difficult though for especially for young people to to be realistic and because you've got to weigh it up against belief in yourself and ambition yeah, yeah. versus being realistic and that's not always easy not that's even tough it's yeah. hard for me to yeah. do at 40 yeah. let alone yeah, uh, it was, yeah, it was really it was tough but on the same token it was again it goes back to the the information that we were drip fed all the way through with all our coaches and you know mm -hmm. Arthur Gray and Medi Gray Paul Hart top top coaches and what they do and and it was like okay you might not be you might not play professional football for Leeds United in the first team but there are 72 other countries that have professional football you can go and have a career in the game if you apply yourself properly and so that was always the message to everybody so even though you can okay I may not get there I'd love to get there I'd, mm. nothing nothing would have been better than playing for Leeds in my eyes and uh, but you know we had Radibi, uh, Molinar, Weatherall, Woodgate was Woodgate was on a complete different planet and, and at that stage they don't forget like I said they'd won the league so they knew what yeah. that looked like and felt like and the kind of players they needed and wanted to get back to it and um, uh, and there's only so much youngsters you can bring through as well. Don't forget, course, they yeah. brought through about eight, nine of them, which is already a, a huge reflection of it. And uh, so then, uh, through playing for Wales in 16s, 18s, 21s, um, Bobby rang me up, Bobby Gould. It was when the whole turnover happened at Cardiff, and and he said, uh, "Do you want to come down to Cardiff?" And I had a year left on my contract at Leeds at this stage, and I was like. Uh, well, I'm not sure I've got a year left in my contract. He goes, just just come down, come down, give us a month and let's see how you like it afterwards. And and I, and I loved it. I really, really enjoyed it. I came down, had two weeks, played in a few friendlies. And I'd always been a centre-back. Like I said, I, were, I was fortunate I was really mobile. Um, you want to think that now mm -hmm. looking at me, but um, you know, I, was, I was athletic, I was quick. Uh, oh, not, not so quick, but just... No, not yeah, slow. Yeah, I could get through the gears and, and running was something that came quite easy and... Mm. Um, and then so but I wanted to get on the ball and I remember playing Aberystwyth and Bobby came in half time and he was like saying hey, not fucking Beckenbauer in a way in a way you think you are but uh, he goes we're going to put you into midfield and I was like oh never, never played yeah. it was the one position I'd never even played as a kid in midfield and uh, went in there and he just said all you've got to do basically with your athleticism is go from box to box as quick as you can and there's a bit of a direct style of play that we had and uh, and it was easy, so I was like, okay, no problem. So I went into midfield, came back after that, and then two days later, Cardiff will play. Uh, he said they went into the office the next day, and they were like, right, we want to sign you. Spoken to Leeds, uh, so I rang up O'Leary, who was a coach at the time, and he was like, yeah, I think you should go. Um, and I'd, I'd had a bit of a bust up with O'Leary as well. Okay, how um, did that come about? Uh, it was. Uh, I uh, just frustrated you not know, being a being a dickhead youngster and like I said I was pretty strong strong minded then and uh, got called into the office when I had I'd fallen out with the reserve team coach because we were doing this uh, training session that I didn't didn't agree with and fell out with him uh, sent me off the ground off the field so uh, and then got called into the manager's office knew he was coming and everything and uh, and I walked into the office and uh, and he yeah he just went nuts he went absolutely mm -hmm. nuts and. He was like, we'd signed a few uh, new players, and he said, oh, 
you're strutting around you thinking you're better than such and such and, and I was like oh, I don't know I think I am I mm. think I am better than him and, and he go and he was like saying oh that's you know we we spent x amount of million on that person and, and I was like no my fault were you waste your money on <laughs> And that was it then. That, there was no, there was no coming back yeah. from that. And you know, he, uh, there was a few things in terms of he totally lost it. So you had, it. you had self belief in yourself, like you believed yeah. in your ability. I knew I wasn't a wood get. I knew I wasn't as good as wood. Like on the ball, I, I was as good, but I knew I wasn't. Uh, oh my god, you, people have no idea how quick Woodgate was and how mm. good a defender he was and uh, how tight he could get and uh, he was rapid and. You know, we talk about Gabidon, and uh, I, I thought Gabidon had the capability, even though he went and played Premiership football with a big club like West Ham, I thought Gabidon could have gone further again. Yeah, I did too. Um, because technically, athletically, he was superb, but... Um, the way he read the game for oh, me was everything. Just, uh, and Woodgate was just, my God, he was I think with Woodgate, people forget, like, Madrid spent 30 million yeah. or whatever it was on him yeah. back in the day, like... It was he was just so unfortunate with the injuries yeah. after that point, but there was a reason they spent that money because yeah. he was rated as one of the best young fullback uh, centre backs yeah. in Europe. Yeah, he was. Yeah, and and you know that's just like a technical and physical perspective. His mm. uh, uh, the person who was in and around the club, the dressing room, his banter was was, was outrageous, and um, but he was a winner, like a yeah. real so determined in every every training session, every game is. He generally had the belief that he was better. Made his debuts against, uh, you know, when he played against Renato. We'd ask him what was it like playing Venice Roy Henry and John Hatton and people like that, and and he was like saying, yeah, yeah, I think I'm better. And you're like, wow, you know, just that, just Confidence. that, yeah, yeah, incredible. And so you know, there's a lot to be said in terms of having that self belief. And but anyway, I yeah, came to Cardiff, played in midfield, and um, who was the first person you met at Cardiff? Otherwise. Uh, well, it's quite. Fuck, I don't even know because it's quite. I I knew the under twenty ones and the Welsh boys, so I knew Ernie and everybody yeah. anyway. And um, but when you when you come into a, a senior environment, people are welcoming, but they're also oh, Jesus. Here we go. And because of the new ownership, the players that were there at the time, no doubt looking back, were probably going, Jesus Christ, you know, more players, more mm. players, more players, and. So, uh, and that's what they created. They created an environment by signing so many people where it was, uh, you know, you had to train well and you had to perform because if you didn't you, and you got left out of the squad, you might not, like in my case, you never get, never get back in. And So um, we, yeah, signed anyway, got released, uh, finished, got my contract uh, paid up from Leeds, came to um, Cardiff, uh, on a, and it was only a one year contract and I'm looking back now and I'm going it was I want they offered me a two year contract and for some reason I said no I'll have a one year contract and uh, with incentives of getting a better contract afterwards yeah. and uh, I, look back, I was 19 Jesus I, I couldn't even know, negotiate my contract now mm -hmm. and, but I was doing all this at 19 and um, Did you didn't have an agent or anyone like no, that? No, didn't have an agent. I just I, I spoke to Bobby as it was, and uh, again it came back to that little bit of a, a stubbornness in my mind, and I was like, no, I'll just give me a contract, and it kept me really hungry um, okay. because I knew what was waiting for me if yeah. I m met a certain amount of games. Uh, so anyway, I made my debut against Palace in the cup uh, as a right winger. So Bowen so moved again. Yeah, Bowes got injured, and um, Jason Bowen. Well, fuck you, play. Yeah. yeah, and uh, oh my god, and uh, so he got injured. And Bobby goes, Kev, you're playing right wing, and I was like, Well, oh, all right, Gabby Don was right back, and I was right wing. And uh, Don Guess, Guess made his debut, Guess Jones made his debut that night as well. And Guess, Guess got man of the match, I think, that night, he was unbelievable. And um, yeah, then that week, I think it was Mark Bonner broke his leg. And so I went into centre midfield with Willie, and it was only I, you know Bonds is a really good midfielder. Willie, them two had a great partnership in there, uh, and this was my first ever time in midfield. So, you know, people are like saying, "Oh, you're in there," you know, replacing. But but I still thought of myself as a centre back, so yeah. I was just playing the thing and doing whatever I could for the team, and and we done really well. And we went I, when I turned up, we were like thirteenth in Div three or something like that, and and before you knew it, the, everything started. Leo Fortune West came in and. It all started to click. Bags. Yeah, yeah, and Ernie was just outrageous. Paul Brayson, Bowen, Josh Lowe's, you know, you start going through good, and you'll good go. Good young players. Yeah, it was. What was Josh Lowe like? Because uh, he yeah. always got 
first deck and yeah, he's so a shy guy. Yeah, shy guy. Yeah, he's just no shy guy. Just keeps himself to himself. Mm. Really professional. Uh, he was studying law while while training and playing. So you look at him now, and he's been a lawyer for like five years. Came mm. out of him, was worked for the PFA was in law and. Uh, Josh was a, was a good guy, good professional. Uh, mm. Still, still really close with Josh. So I would, through bias, say that you know. He well, I thought, I thought he was really. A, I thought he was quite an underrated yeah. footballer as well. Yeah, um, and oh, so quick, so quick, so like just speed and power, uh, and done really well for us that year. And um, but it was yes. And then when Bonds came back, Willie broke his leg. Or well, it was the other way around. Maybe yeah. Willie broke it first and Bonds then broke it afterwards. So the mm-hmm. first game they came back together, yeah, that's how it was. I finished the season with Willie. Uh, so Willie broke it, his leg first and then and then Bonds came back in and then Bonds broke his leg. So mm-hmm. I went straight back in and yeah. I carried on playing. So I'd have somehow managed to have racked up like 30-odd games that year as a midfielder. But when, when we got to, because of the run we had... Uh, they they called me in after like 15 games and Bristol City, uh, Bristol Rovers had been sniffing, Carlisle had been sniffing because they knew I only had like five months, six months left in my contract yeah. uh, and I had a four-year deal, um, which n- knowing what deal I'd be having. So it was a case of, oh yeah, brilliant. And uh, we got promoted. You know, I can't I reflect on that. That year is just, it, it was incredible. I went to Magaluf at the end of the season mm. and, uh, uh, but it was brilliant. But we ki- we got kicked out of the Welsh squad that year as well. So it was, you know, the uh, we broke curfew. So we uh, we were in Armenia, and uh, we got like ten o'clock curfew or something like that. I don't care. We're away international mm. in the twenty ones. But this was it, the the cultural difference then to where it's at now. Turn up, turn up to Wales at that stage. Unfortunately, was was a, a bit of a piss up. Yeah, and, enjoy it. Yeah, and uh, and that. Wasn't just the twenty ones mentality. Of the, that was, that was through the whole thing, and uh, I think that was all sports as well. Rugby, yeah, cricket. Yeah. Like we used to go away with Glamorgan, and you know, you'd be playing in a tournament, but it was effectively like you're going up to Ample Fourth in Yorkshire. Yeah, piss up. Yeah, just what it yeah, was. It was back then. Yeah, it, it was wasn't. Yeah, so you know, we on tour basically. Yeah, and it wasn't through a case of. You know, we were steaming. Or yeah. Anything. It was just we were just so out, we were just we were just stupid because the where we were staying, the hotel, the the business literally right across the road had a restaurant, casino, club, mm. uh, all all in one. So we were like, right, we're heading over there, sort of thing, and and the whole team were over there, um, and just basically few of us stayed longer than what we should have. We were having a hell of a laugh and. And we could see the elevator coming up, and somebody was in Welsh tops. We were in our Welsh tops as well. It wasn't as if we were in the yeah, skies. Yeah. And uh, we could see uh, somebody coming up, and we were like, oh, yeah, the boys are coming back. This is going to be amazing. And Because we were just at that 30 minute after curfew, and we were, we were yeah. basically going back anyway. But when we seen them coming up, we were like, going, oh, this is yeah. going to be absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, we're, it's on. And, you know, and, you know, those impromptu parties you go to, yeah. you're just the best nights. And, uh, yeah, it turned out with her. We looked across and we we're like, oh, shit, he's got white hair. That's not one of the boys, mm-hmm. one of the coaches. So for the next 20 minutes, we were all playing like hide and seek and everything with the coaches <laughs> in this nightclub. We were grabbing clothes off the people and putting like changing clothes, putting yeah. hats on, sunglasses. And yeah, it was, you look back and it was funny. But then when they, the, like, they probably didn't find it funny, didn't find it, yeah, didn't, and rightly so. Uh, so then we, uh, went across because we were going to like think right we'll sneak over we were going to buy these clothes off these people sneak back mm-hmm. in hotel and get up to your room quick sort yeah of yeah and um, but anyway they they caught us and <laughs> no, no big surprise and uh, then we went through as we were walking through reception there was Mark Hughes and everybody there and next day then went down to do our yeah. recovery session um, it's and, not what you want is it you don't want the, the first team manager to be there do you no nah, nah. and oh they, but they knew so they were going to stamp it down but so when we were flying back and from like again gary speed came up and he go he was like saying you know it's not ultimately your fault yeah you were stupid yeah you got caught out and you broke curfew and everything goes but it, it is an issue within our culture that you know and it's something that we're addressing and you know and they were they were good like saying oh we'll you know we'll talk to sparky and uh, we'll we'll Smooth it yeah, we'll smooth it over, sort of thing, and uh, and we were so we were like going, oh jeez, you know, we can get away with this, it'll be a fine or something like that, and uh, went into the meeting, and Mark Hughes went through the whole group, saying like, you know, that that it has to change, cultural expectations have to change when you come away representing your country, um, 
and you know all of this and then he said oh the four boys who were out can you stay behind so we thought you know we'd have a ball we'd have to clean all the players boots yeah. or something like that uh okay guys go pack your bags you're out we're kicking you out of the squad uh, that hurt I made an example of you. that hurt yeah yeah but it's you know rightly so we broke yeah. curfew I'm, I'm not criticizing no Mark Hughes for that but it also I suppose if they wanted to change that culture the way to do it is to make an example yeah. of the people who've just broken the curfew and yeah because yeah. you're saying to anyone else, if you do this, yeah. if you don't change the, the culture when you come away with Wales and don't be professional, you're out. You're out. Yeah. Yeah, and so was, who was that then? It was you? Uh, Reese Weston. I, uh, do you know what? I thought I'd heard yeah. part of this story. Ken, was Reece. Yeah. Lee Kendall and uh, Steve Steve Evans, I think he was as well, from mm. Crystal Palace, not Evo, from TNS and, and Wrexham, okay. I think. But uh, one of the boys from Crystal Palace and... Um, and look, it wasn't as if we were like three hours over yeah. curfew and steaming. And um, but anyway, it, was that it happened. A long journey home. Yeah. Well, we we didn't find out till we got back to the Vale. So it was Mother's Day. Rang up Mother's mm. Day and say, "Hey, mum, happy Mother's Day." Yeah, I've just been kicked out of the Welsh squad. Mm. And she was like, "Ah, oh, what you do?" I said, "Broke curfew." And uh, yeah, you decade. And uh, anyway, yeah. So that was um, that was that. But went back to Cardiff then and said to you know. I thought we did get made an example of. Um, and I know. Spoke to Ken. Spoke to Reese because we were all at Cardiff. Yeah. And I was like, going, you know, I'm not sure if it's a, a, a if there was anything in between. But funny enough, we went in and started talking to Bobby and Corky about it, and uh, and they thought we'd been harsh, quite harshly treated as well. Which again, you look back because they loved that almost. We had a crazy gang mentality. We were going yeah. out. We, we were all young. Uh, all playing first team football, and you know they'd be like saying, "Hey, no, you know you haven't we'll got a midweek game. Out, yeah, go out, get yourself out, take the boys out. You know Tuesday night, mm -hmm. take yourself out. Don't be stupid, but go have a good night and uh, back in on Thursday. Make sure you're ready to train Thursday." And uh, so it was, it, it was almost not washed over, but you know we we had a suspend, we had a fine and everything from Cardiff as well, and, and yeah. rightly so. But yeah, so we got promoted basically that year, and. Uh, that summer then was the summer where Cav, um, Peter Thorne, Des Hamilton, you know, we yeah. we turned up with, I think we started that pre-season with about 38 pros, who was, right, yeah. um, and, oh, it, like, Kavanagh was Unreal, outstanding, yeah. outstanding, not just, you know, as, as a captain, he was a brilliant captain, but as a player, the person he was in around the group, uh, yeah, he was there. Standards mm. were there. The way he conducted himself, and um, but he'd always you know, and I got on really well with Cavi. After every training session, he'd, he'd pull me aside and say, "Come on, it's going to do some extras." And uh, he might he might want he was wanting to work on receiving the ball on his back foot or something like that. But he'd do make sure I would be doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and he was he was excellent with me. Not just myself, with other youngsters. You could see he'd almost go around everybody and say. If you think somebody was looking down or having a bit of a tough time, but but were doing the right things, he'd go up to him and say, "Okay, let's go and do this. Let's go and do that." And uh, learned a lot from that in terms of how a captain should look. And uh, but I still had three years after my contract, mm. uh, so it was it was really. Do you feel like you learn a lot from being kicked out of the Wales squad? Did that gives you like a bit of a. Oh, it's the embarrassment. Focus, or, or yeah, like, yeah. Like, like to sort of change maybe, just your I don't know maybe the yeah. way you looked at. Yeah, it did. Away trips and it def uh, it definitely generally. did. Yeah, it, it totally changed. It was unfortunately the um, the realization of you know, what a professional is, mm. uh, and it almost came too late, sort of thing. Where uh, we got promoted, still had an unbelievable time, and you know that whole year we knew we were going up. So went to Magaluf and uh, just brilliant four days. Then came back to that first day, but then I met my wife. I met mm. Katie then when I came back. So here I am saying, oh, you know, I went from something like uh, we played Hartlepool, I think it was, before we went to Magaluf, Hartlepool away. I went out from that night literally for the next six weeks solid where every night I was out. Not drinking every night, but out, out every night. Mm. And then as it came to the tail end of that, because then now I was like three weeks away from coming back to pre-season as well, uh, my mate came up to me, Banksy came up to me and he was like going, oh, you got to go to Springboks, Springboks Bar, the, the mm. girls are amazing, they're beautiful, they're this, and, and I was like, oh, no, no more, no more, and he goes, come on, honestly, you love it, and then I walked into the bar and Katie was there, uh, she was serving behind the counter, and I went to Banksy, I said, oh, I'm going to marry her, 
and uh, and he was like, oh, Jesus, here we go again, <laughs> sort of thing. And you know, we've all said that, haven't we? And uh, uh, it turned out I did. Yeah. There we go. I married my barmaid as well, by uh, William Boland. Yeah, directing us. Um, so I'm I'm literally just aware of time, really, and, and I don't want the, the cards to run out on the camera and stuff because I I'm really enjoying talking to you. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, with that Cardiff, like when you left Cardiff, what was that? Like, did you leave on kind of good terms? Were you ousted? No, Lenny was brilliant. Lenny Lawrence was really, really good to me. And again, learned, learned a lot from Lenny as, as a coach, a real coach, you know, mm. on the field. Uh, and I, I was probably starting to think then, because I'd just met Katie, we, we just bought a house and getting married. So I was, I was making roots basically in Cardiff. And, yeah. um, but I had, I had like two years left of my contract and, uh, or maybe maybe a bit more. We you know we bought a big house, just knowing that well, I was probably going to get paid up, or I was going to carry on being on that wages. Went alone at Boston, didn't didn't enjoy it one bit. And uh, where's Boston? Lincolnshire. Yeah. It's a bit of a oh, miles and miles away. Nice people there. And, mm. But Steve Evans was the coach, and uh, the, the, he went on to Leeds and everything from there. And but I, I didn't enjoy it. Didn't enjoy it one bit. I, I pulled a hip flexor as well, and so that was a conference. And it's quite funny because when I, the year I went to Swansea, we Swans, Swansea won the league. Yeah. Came to Cardiff the next year. Got Cardiff got promoted. Went to Boston mm. the year after. Boston won the conference. Yeah. Lucky uh, charm. Yeah, just everywhere I was going at that time. Then I went to uh, Newport. Uh, sorry, Merthyr had a good couple of years there. Really enjoyed it there. Went to Newport only like six, seven weeks. Went to Carmarthen. Quali- so we, when I went to Carmarthen, we were like fourth from bottom and ended up qualifying for Europe. And uh, so it, I have been lucky everywhere yeah. I've been. It's it's coincide and even Successful. yeah, and even in coaching. So you know, uh, one like over there, just at the the level that we're at, one like four or five leagues, and, and I've only been coaching like seven, eight years. And uh, but it's. It, that's one thing. So winning, winning thing is one thing, but you don't necessarily feel part of it either. You know, the Cardiff one, you're happy with that one. Achieved, uh, helped the boys with promotion. The others, nothing to do with me really. And um, but it's yeah, Len, Lenny was really good to me. He pulled me in. He goes, "What are you doing?" You're, you know, I was only twenty, twenty one, twenty two at the time, and so I was still really young. And uh, and he was like, "You know, I think you need to go out and you know keep playing football, go on loan because a few clubs had come in on loan and." Uh, and I wasn't wanting to go, and he was like, you know, it's not good when you're turning around and turning loan down. You're yeah. almost telling me you don't want to play football. Yeah. So for us, that is alarm bells, and uh, and I was like, no, no, I want to play football. And he was like, saying, but you're not. Go out on loan and do well. And he goes, you're not a million miles away from. And he and he was really like really good to me. And uh, and then I went in the next day. I said, okay, how much would the club consider um, paying me up? And and he was like, okay. Came back to me with a price the following day. I came back to him with a price, uh, literally 20 minutes later, and he said, yeah, okay. He goes, you're not being unrealistic, and that was it. Got paid up, and um, and, and I'm not sure whether it was, again, you know, you go back to the whole council state mentality of, you know, once you have a house paid off, I say, you know, you know you're know, mortgage-free, and whether that was the security that yeah. I was looking for at that time, just having a wife, we were wanting kids, and um, yeah, so it, it was... Yeah, quite quite funny how it all just went out there and over quickly, and then we got into S Four C and BBC, and I, I almost got comfortable in not playing for Cardiff because uh, I was contracted, still training, still doing. I kind of loved the reserve games and and everything, but on the weekends then I was starting to do commentating uh, in because I could speak Welsh and mm. and I was really enjoying that part of it, and then doing some TV presenting because was and still am a really good looking guy, and uh, no, yeah, it goes without saying. Thank you, thank you, but um. Yeah, it was yeah, like minus Gold Coast tan as well. So. Yeah, yeah, Sunshine Coast tan. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But then we so we went a bit of coaching, bit of. Uh, but we got to Katie was raised in South Africa. Uh, she's Welsh, but raised in South Africa, and wanted that outdoor lifestyle. And we really wanted to have the kids to have freedom, uh, and having two passports was something that we were really, really quite motivated about. So we we went to Australia in two thousand and six. We we actually left Wales the day Steve Irwin died. So you know the crocodile hunter Steve yeah, Irwin. Yeah. yeah, we left Wales the day he. Funny things you remember, isn't it? Yeah, we woke up and everybody's like, "Don't go! It's a sign! It's this! It's that!" And uh, but so we arrived to Queensland, where where we live. Steve Irwin Zoo is only like forty five minutes away from where we live. 
wow. to the area literally morning. It was, you know, it was, but it was really quite emotional, moving, seeing all that take place. And yeah. and I've loved it. We've yeah. So my my daughter was eighteen months, son was ten months. We we'd never been there before that. We didn't have any family. We just it's the perfect age. I almost yeah. meant to emigrate yeah. because they you're not disrupting school and yeah. Well, we thought we thought well, because I was still only twenty five, and I go well, this is a four. It's, it's so young. It's though, a four year it? commitment. Yeah, Kate was twenty two, but then you know. It is young, but then you look at it and you go, well, I left home at 14. I was, yeah. I've been negotiating contracts yeah. since so I was 15. you've grown up a lot quicker yeah. than your average 25-year-old. And you've been around, like, good people like Kavanagh mm. and, uh, you know, good pros up in the league, like, like how you've seen the senior players. And so you kind of were ground, rounded, I guess, as, mm. a, as a person. So we were like, yeah, let's go there. Even get our citizenship. If it doesn't work out, we can move back. And I'd still have only been 29. I could still come back, play Welsh League and... And, and pick up a career with a in some form after that, but we've we, we've loved it. Yeah, we've yeah. we've really loved it. Sunny mate as well. The thing. It, it's too sunny sometimes from November to to February. It's disgusting. The the heat. Yeah, I think the only thing which would bother me is today Christmas Day. Yeah, having I mean, like a Christmas dinner in sunshine. Yeah, I think that would bother me. Other than that, I think yeah. sun all year round. But it, it, only now we're starting to probably come out of the roasts at Christmas Day. So. For the first 13, 14 years, it was like, nah, roast, roast, no, roast. But we're just starting to now probably go, because our kids don't like it. The kids don't like the roasts. We like it, being British yeah, part. Boring, but they, uh, they, they like the, the cold pools, the, the salads, and barbecue. in the pool, the barbecue stuff. And, um, what a life. It, it, look, it's, it's funny. I've been on the course all week, and people are going, oh, so you, are you in Australia? Yeah, full time. Yeah. yeah. And then they go, oh, God, that must be okay. And you go, it, it's sometimes you need to come out of an environment to be able to reflect and go. Yeah, I appreciate it. Wow, God, yeah, I loved it there. And um, but I'd never, you know, part of getting the A license over here. I've got my A license already in Asia, uh, the AFC. So okay. I'm now doing the UEFA. Um, is you know my my son and daughter, eighteen and sixteen. I've mentioned a few times. I'll maybe go and live in the UK at some stage. And uh, it just it's there to an opportunity to knock on doors if, if something did happen or something did open up and I've had a few sniffs from you know a couple of Welsh Prem clubs have, uh, have asked the question before and um, but it's not you're going to relocate from Australia yeah. though I think you've got to it's got to be the right job yeah. I mean, and the yeah. right situation yeah, yeah. yeah. And this uh, is a big ask isn't it yeah. otherwise to and, and there's a whole you know this there's big movement and course, emotional yeah. attachment as well isn't it because of the qualified for the World Cup and uh, Welsh national team doing brilliant and Matty's doing you know couldn't be prouder of him and how well he's doing and and it's no surprise it, it would not surprise me to see Matty in five six years time coaching our first team national team no. in Wales and because he's you know the person he is the traits he has he knows a lot of the youngsters you know fast forward six years a lot of the boys he's now coaching in the 16s 18s 21s will probably be our first team players, yeah. so he'd have had that experience with them been in the Welsh system by about 10 years there, played for our country. Um, yeah, there's a lot uh, yeah, There's a lot to say that you'll have a chance, basically. And do you still do um, like media work now and stuff with the S4C? No, nah, not really. Now and again, I talk to Dylan Ebbs from mm -hmm. Scorior and uh, we, we catch up and still still good friends. And he was amazing when watching the game on Sunday. He was literally him, John Hart, and we're like five metres away from me. So I had a really good chat with him and... Uh, and and re I really enjoyed the media side of it, but it's my passion is uh, is coaching and yeah. youth development in particular, and um, probably because of again that grounding I got at Leeds, uh, uh, and I, I've been so lucky when I look back now from a coaching perspective where uh, had them coaches you know first trait they all had they were great people, uh, they were you know they genuinely cared for young people and wanted them to grow up to be successful adults and whether they were footballers or not they were they they wanted us to do well in life and uh but i think that's so important mate. Yeah. i really do i think that like, we talked about what's gone on with my kids and the football thing mm. just before we started recording and like some clubs view them as just numbers yeah, yeah. some clubs take the time to really not just develop them as footballers but as people and help them grow into whatever they're going to yeah. be. Maybe it's not a footballer, but you can still... But it was them standards, how they, they instilled standards in us in terms of how we have to conduct ourselves. Yeah. And you know, and then, and then the Gary Speed, just a 
little words of just that one sentence. He probably only spoke, said like five words, five five things to me in my whole mm. life. And but one of them was, you know, you got to conduct yourself Stop properly. Being. Yeah, you got to look after yourself. And you kind of go, okay. And then you go go to Cardiff and you you get people like you know um, like Cavs and people you look up to. Jason Bowen was was a good great guy to be around as well. Young Ian, you know, you look at someone like Scott Young and what he achieved with the club. Unbelievable. Yeah, and you go, well, was he? blessed with all this ability and thought no but what he had was every day you train the house you do everything he can you go out in the field and you know exactly what you're going to get out of him every week and he would die for that club mm. and i seen him i only seen him in the holland game on wednesday and um but uh yeah love seeing him and you know he, he lived and breathed everything winning winning for cardiff for young he looked a lot different for anybody else everybody else was happy winning you know happy you know win bonuses and everything like that Youngie's motivation was never money. Yeah. He was like, no, no, we've got, you know, Cardiff. Cardiff. Oh, he lived and breathed it. And um, uh, and that, you know, so little things like that you, you learn and then went to command. Then Mark Hazelwood was my coach. Uh, Mark Jones, so Joan is local to this mm. area. Joan, again, unbelievable person and uh, really cares about the person before the, the player. Hazelwood's tactical and technical detail was... On, on par with anybody I've ever worked with or been in a coach education room with. Andy Beatty at, uh, at Merthyr was phenomenal, the, the information he had. But he, so he gave the tactical detail, technical knowledge, great laugh. And then John, Rello, John Relish uh, was, you know, was the person that worked with the person. And so it's, it's really molded me and, and almost guided me to, uh, to have some of the traits that I enjoy having as a coach, and you know, my, my proudest moment to date as a coach, and I know it's a it's a weird way of looking at uh, success, is uh, un- unfortunately one of the most probably the best youngster I've worked with passed away last year in a car crash. Well, not in a car crash, he survived the car crash, but as he was waiting for the emergency services to come, he got hit by another car, and uh, uh, horrific. So that happened uh, last August, and. Uh, but then his family come in and asking me to speak at his funeral is uh, and I was like, you know, blown away and they're saying, Well, you, you know, what you've done for him and the, and us as a family and uh that's probably my proudest moment, which is also my worst moment in yeah, in coaching. But when when you then start to say, Okay, you're, you're having a connection with people with you're having an, an influence on yeah, people. Not not just the person, not just the the player that you're working with and making them hopefully making them a better player, you're struggling yeah. for mm-hmm. making them worse. <laughs> But uh, but as a person, yeah, as a human being, as a per- and and the family and the extended yeah. family and they and, you know and, and that's important to me and uh, and you know caring about young people and uh, the environment that they grow up because we know we all know how bad and detrimental mental health is. We all suffer with it in some different way or shape or form. Yeah, and um, but if you know if you can genuinely, when shit hits the fan, look at yourself and go. I'm a good person. I, I genuinely care for other people, and I want other people to have a good life as well. And uh, and a lot, so much good things come off just having that positive outlook. Of, uh, and that to me is the most rewarding thing is when you can look after other people. That's more powerful than being paid extremely well. And uh, you know, because when you strip away all the money and uh, like I said, you know, yeah, it looks like you've been really successful, mm-hmm. and you go, well, yeah, but the biggest success is that when here I am, I can go to Cardiff City and walk in and there's people still there that remember me from 20 and I, I've been away 16 years and mm. uh, and they're still like oh you know great to see you see youngie and it's like it's a warm embrace it's not just a hey how you doing next yeah, team yeah. it's like a Jesus great to see yeah, you yeah great to see you sort of thing and, and that and that means a lot to me you know it's that I see that as rewarding and it means uh, more than money and, and 100% fame and yeah. things like that don't I think um, I think um, Kev that's a phenomenal way to kind of wrap us up there I could literally sit here and speak to you for another two three hours but uh, unfortunately we're kind of low on time now which I've got is a flight a, to a catch as well. you've got a flight to <laughs> yeah. catch um, yeah. I do really appreciate you finding the time mate in your week uh, over back in sunny Wales to uh, come and speak to me I do really appreciate it because I've re- just enjoyed having a chat in the mm. car on the way over here and, and particularly in this um, and I'd actually like to do a part two probably over Zoom now yeah, um, love to. Yeah, and perhaps go into the the coaching side of things. And, yeah, I'd love to because it's yeah. there's a lot of ground to cover with that side of things. Not just with what you've done with coaching, but also 
coaching generally yeah. and, and youth development and stuff like that it's something which interests me a lot yeah um, I'll, I'll look and, and credit to you guys for for what you do it's you know you're, you're, you're raising bringing awareness to people on in particular in the mental health space it's it's something that is still you know a, a ex-teammate unfortunately uh you know the, we're at a funeral today and, yeah. and because of uh, with what's happened with him and you kind of look at it as you know so many people still going through some difficult periods but if you know, if we can bring, keep bringing awareness to it and pe- trying to open up, because we've all suffered with it in some form or capacity, but it's, yeah, it's really important. So credit to you and what you're doing, mate. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. And like, it's, uh, it's an important subject for me personally anyway, but like, I find that it's important to spread that awareness and try and get people generally to, to talk about it. But also, like I look at my kids, I've got three boys, 17, 15 and 13, and they're going to be at points now in the next coming years where they're going to have problems or they're going to have times where yeah. they feel like everything's getting a bit too much. And I want them to have the tools to deal with it yeah. better than what I did because I dealt with it with drinking and yeah. doing things I shouldn't have. Yeah, overeating and... Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and you know what, I, but I paid for it later on in life because of yeah the issues that it caused. And not confronting it, yeah. 100%. So, it, well, we talk a lot about it and just to finally, I know we're wrapping mm. it up, but it's... Um, I have a look at it and say, good, better, how. If if when you're feeling absolutely at your worst or something, try and remind yourself what you're good at or the, the good traits you have as a human. What some of the things you might be able to make better and how. But it's important that when we reflect on ourselves, we you know start from a point of kindness to yourself of, you know, what what are the good things that you bring as a person. Start then instead of you know we're we're often so critical on oh how can I get better how can we get better whether it's a football or whatever we do in life. But if you reflect on, well, these are the things that I do really well, all of a sudden your own self-talk becomes a hell of a lot more powerful yeah. and you're kinder to yourself. So good, better, how is, uh, yeah, is a simple like way of that. looking at things. I do like that a lot. Um, it's been a pleasure, mate. It has really been really, enjoyed mate. it. No, I really you. appreciate it. Um, guys, please do subscribe, all that stuff. Like, share, all the, all the usual stuff. And uh, check out the Sports Social Podcast Network, Violet Money, Eat Sleep Media. Uh, and also check out... Um, Fume for your giving up smoking needs and um, heights for your brain supplement needs. Links to everything in the description, as always. Thank you.